Our first examples are going to be really familiar examples. So if you take the integers, so I always have to specify a set and an operation. So integers under addition is a group. And it's never enough to just assert that something is a group. I really have to check that it satisfies the definition. So I have a set with an operation, and I need to check that there's an identity, which is 0, because 0 plus anything is that thing back again. I need to check that it's associative, but this is something we happen to know about the integers. And finally, I need to check that inverses exist. And this is good because, you know, if you have x, there exists some number that we're going to call negative x, such that x plus negative x is equal to the identity. So given an x, I can always get back to the identity by adding negative x. And negative x is actually in the integers. On the other hand, if I were to look at the natural numbers, with addition, there's still an identity. Addition is still associative, but I don't have inverses. If I take 2, negative 2 is not a natural number. Likewise, if I take the integers with multiplication as my operation, I have an identity. The identity is 1. Multiplication of integers is associative. So that's cool. And then for inverses, I say, OK, well, inverses. So I need So let's suppose I look at the number 2. I need some number that I can multiply by 2 to get back to the identity. Obviously, the thing that we put in here is a half. But a half is not an integer. So we don't have inverses in the integers. So this is not a group. So it's not just that integers exist. It's that they, in, or sorry, it's not just that the inverses have to exist. The inverses have to be in the set that we're concerned with. OK. So that's pretty reasonable. Um, maybe I'll give you one more example before we move on to a more interesting one. So if I take the rational numbers with multiplication, again, we have an identity, which is 1. And we know that multiplication is still associative. So that's cool. And for inverses, we say, OK, well, for our example with 2, a half is a rational number. So that seems OK. Unfortunately, there's one rational number which doesn't have an inverse. And that's the number 0. So inverses are OK, except x equals 0. There is no multiplicative inverse for 0. So the rational numbers are, do not form a group under multiplication. However, however, what we often do is we'll write q times, and this is going to be just the rational numbers without the number 0. And that is a multiplicative group. Likewise, we can take r cross. So this is the real numbers with 0 taken away with the operation of multiplication. And if you're in, interested in complex numbers, you can do the same thing with complex numbers. And those are all fine. Furthermore, if we don't have r cross, 
So if we're looking at just R, just Q, these are all additive groups as well, as we know, for the same reason that the integers with addition is an additive group. Now, all of these are also examples of commutative groups because we know that addition and multiplication are commutative. Okay, so let's see a slightly more interesting example. So our next example, let's call it example one, is going to be the integers mod n. Now you may not have seen this before, I'm not sure. So this is the set, 0, 1, dot, 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 up to n minus 1. And we're going to give it the operation of addition. And I have to tell you how this addition works. So there's a couple different ways to think about it. My favorite way to think of it is I take, in fact, let's call this plus sub n. So that way we know that we're really working in Zn. We won't always call it plus sub n. We'll often just call it plus. But for the moment, I'm going to call it plus sub n. So the operation is defined by, so I'll just think of these as integers for the moment, and I'll add them together like integers. So a plus nb is equal to a plus b. Now, if you think of just any old integers between 0 and n minus 1, if, say, a and b were both n minus 1, then probably we're going to fall outside of the set. So they're going to be bigger than, bigger than or equal to n. And then we have a problem. So we have to do something to get back into zn. And what I do for that is I write this operation that looks like this. And what this means is divide by n and keep the remainder. Simple enough. So let's try it out. If we look at, say, z3, as a set, this is the set 0, 1, 2. And we have our nice operation, so let's try some addition. So let's see. If we take 1 plus 1, that'll be 2 percent 3. So this is this modular arithmetic thing. All of this is called modular arithmetic, by the way. So I divide 2 by 3 and keep the remainder. And that's equal to 2, which is indeed in Z3. OK, let's try a slightly more complicated one. 2 plus 2. Well, that's equal to 4% 3. And now when I divide 4 by 3 and keep the remainder, I get 1. And that's back in Z3 again. So that's OK. Now. I should probably convince you that this is actually a group. Like I said, we always have to verify that things are groups. So we have to check that there's an identity. And indeed, there is. If I take 0 plus something and then take the remainder when I divide by n, I'm going to get the same thing back. So the 0 is the identity. Check. If I do associativity, it might actually be a little bit more to check there. And I'll leave that to you guys. This one comes down to noticing that addition is associative. And this is really very similar to a division operation. So division is basically multiplication in reverse. So associativity here can boil down to the fact that division and addition of integers are also associative. So this comes from facts about integers.
I should probably say now that associativity is usually the hardest one to actually check. Um, it's actually fairly easy to check this brute force for Z3. You just form every product of three things and then check that the associativity works for every possible product. A little long computationally. When we have an infinite group, that's never going to be an option. You have to figure out some other way to show associativity. There's a few tricks that we have, and maybe we'll see a couple later. Finally, I need to show that there are inverses. Now, let's say I have x, and now I want to add something to x in order to get back to 0. Right? So I think maybe what I'll do is put in negative x percent n. OK? So negative x, when I divide by n, has some remainder, right? So let's see what this does. I'm going to put a question mark there because we haven't quite seen that it works yet. So this is x plus negative x percent n percent n, right? Let's see. So the neat trick here is that this, like multiplication, actually distributes. This is something to show, but it works. So this is equal to x percent n plus negative x percent n percent n. Now, remember, this is divide by n and take the remainder. So if I divide by n and take the remainder, and then divide by n and take the remainder again, I actually get the same thing back. Dividing by n and keeping the remainder puts me back in the set from 0 to n minus 1. And when I divide one of these by n and take the remainder, I just get the same thing back. For example, 1 divided by n, keep the remainder, I get 1. So doing this twice doesn't do anything extra. So this is equal to x percent n plus negative x percent n. And now I can use the fact that this distributes again and pull the percent n out. This is x plus negative x percent n. x plus negative x we know is 0. So that's 0 percent n, which is equal to 0. Check. Thus, Zn actually forms a group. Again, whenever we need a new group, we really have to check that it is a group. And you do that check by going through each of the properties and seeing that it works out. Zn, we can also note, is a commutative group because this addition that happens in the operation is actually reversible. The addition of integers inside of here is commutative, so it doesn't matter which direction A and B came in in. All right. So I think one of the things we want to do here at this point is talk a little bit about what a subgroup is. So if H is a subset of G, where G is a group, or G is a group here, and H is a group with the same operation as G, then we call H a subgroup. Now, I don't want to get too much into the implications of this. We're going to see lots and lots of subobjects over the course of the term, and we're going to come back and say a number of important things about subgroups. But I just want to give an example, because we're at a place where it'll be really easy to do that. So let's say we look at Z6, which is the set 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then within Z6, I want to set H to 
to be the set 0, 2, 4. Oh, and I made a board mistake. So let's fix that. This uh, 6, remember Z6 is 0 through n minus 1, so it's really just 0 up to 5. Okay. So then we set H to be 0, 2, 4. And now let's figure out if H is actually a subgroup. So H contains the identity from Z6, so H has an identity. It's associative because Z6 has an associative uh, product, or an uh, addition rather, and inverses we need to check. So in fact, if we take 4 plus 2, we get 6, and 6% 6, 6 is 0. So 2 and 4 are inverse to one another, and 0 is its own inverse. So what that tells us is H actually has inverses, thus H is a subgroup. subgroup. Okay, so I think that's a pretty reasonable example there. Let's see. Ooh, one other thing I want to show you. Um, another type of terminology that we have is, uh, or another piece of terminology, is a cyclic group. So we say G is cyclic. If every element in G, so every X in G is writable as A to the N for a multiplicative group, or N times A for an additive group, for some integer n. Now, a to the n, so for our multiplicative group, that really just means that we multiply a together n times, just like we remember defining powers of integers back in uh, grade school. And you know, if it's a negative n, then we're talking about the inverse of a raised to the nth power. Likewise, n times a in the additive group is going to mean adding a to itself n times. So if we look at our z6, we get to see an example of this. If we take the number 1, every other element in this you can write is n times 1. So 2 times 1, 3 times 1, 4 times 1, 5 times 1, and finally 0 times 1. Okay? Therefore, z6 is a cyclic group. Inside of Z6, we have this H, and we have 2 here, and 2 times 2 is 4, and 3 times 2 is 6, which is the same as 0 in Z6. So H is also a cyclic group. We'll call A so A, by the way, should be in G. So A is the generator. Of G. So here our generator is 2, and here our generator is 1. Interesting thing is that the generator doesn't need to be unique. So for example, if I take 5, So if we think of the number 5, well, let's see what happens. So we've got 2 times 5 is equal to 10, which is the same as 4. And 3 times 5 is equal to 15, which is the same as 3. And 4 times 5 is equal to 20, which is the same as 2. Each time I'm dividing by 6 and keeping the remainder, right? 20 is 2 more than 18, so that's why I have a 2 there. And finally, I have 5 times 5 is 
25, which is one more than 24, so the remainder there is one. And finally, I'm gonna sketch in here that one times five is equal to five. So Z6, remember, we're using as an additive group, so I'm looking at N times A. And indeed, everything in Z6, I've been able to write as some, some well, yeah, some integer times five. Therefore, Z6 is cyclic, and five is another choice of generator. Okay, so I think that's probably a pretty decent introduction to the integers modulo n. This can be seven, it can be 12, whatever we want. Okay, so let's see a different example. <coughs> 